It is such a joy to sing the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good to have our brother Michael back with us this morning. Let's open our Bibles, Revelation chapter 1, as we continue our course through the New Testament. Judges chapter 3 on Wednesday night. Actually, I think we're still in chapter 2. Only made it about halfway through. But I tell you what, this morning we're going to close chapter 1 of Revelation. Verse 17, we continue our course. Excited to hear, I pray, what the Lord has to say, to see the vision that sits before us, consider its purpose. Amen? Title for our message today, it's on the screen, Clarifying the Commission, Clarifying the Commission. Take those flyers and invitations if you want, like, more. We can print more. And if you want to provide the cost to print more, that's cool, too. But invite everyone you can think of to come to this parenting conference. And again, you know, if, if kids aren't in your current picture, situation, whatever, come and volunteer so we can send these parents who, you know, uh, do labor and serve in children's ministry and these kinds of things so they can come and husband can wife, uh, and wife, can you imagine? Husband and wife can sit together and, and hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Invite unbelievers. This is evangelistic. Uh, in its purpose and intent uh, as the gospel will be preached. And so let's spread the word and let's see what the Lord will do. Good opportunity. And these guys are great. Their material is awesome. Well, let's go to the Lord. Father, we're so thankful that you're here today. We're rejoicing because your word is a light and a lamp unto our feet and we need it. We confess today that Lord, as Isaiah declared, all like sheep, we have gone astray, each one turning to his own way. God, that's me, that's who we are, that's what we do, and so, Lord, we rejoice that you've given us a sole voice of truth, a foundation on which to build our lives. It's sure, it's stable, it provides shelter, Lord, safety, security, and so many other things. We are so thankful for your word. God, we don't want to hear anything else except the pure milk and meat of your word that we may grow, Lord, in you. Come closer to you, Jesus, and be more like you. That's our prayer. That's our heart today. We're rejoicing this morning as we see Jesus. And we pray that we would see you, Lord, in the light that you have so directed, Lord, according to the vision that John received, Lord, as it imparts a picture's worth a thousand words, as it imparts so much truth, Lord. Help us to see you clearly and surrender our lives to you absolutely. We thank you that that is our glorious privilege. We don't add Jesus to our lives. A long list of God's We abandon everything for just Jesus, just you. As we look at you this morning, just as John did, would we drop dead in a way? Our self-centeredness, God, our rebellious nature, our waywardness, our pride, God, let it die today. And if ever it resurrects, uh, resurrects itself, Lord, Bring us to the foot of the cross. Bring us to this vision of Jesus again so, Lord, he can stay dead, that old man. Work within us today. Sharpen us, Lord, and help us to be more effective for you, we pray. So exciting to be alive in these last days. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen. Well, we've been talking about it for a couple weeks, and I pray it's had an effect upon our lives. John the Apostle here, because he made an all-important choice that I trust we observed, that we can put into practice, because he made that choice too, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of all his difficulties, because he chose to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Look at your Bibles, amen? Because he chose to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day, 
even in the midst of suffering. He got exactly what he needed during that season of difficulty. We all have seasons of difficulty. Thank God they're, they're only seasons. And even if it span the course of our entire physical life, we have an eternity of rest and reward to enter into and enjoy. But the key there is in the response that John the Apostle had to being banished and imprisoned, suffering greatly on the island of Patmos, and he chose to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and thus he saw Jesus Christ. He got, he received what he needed, what we all need in that particular place, and that is a reminder that Jesus is alive. Amen? He's alive and well. He's in the midst of his church. I need to remember that. I need to be encouraged by that. Amen? Amen. He's in the midst of his church, as we've talked about. We'll see again this morning. And he's at work in the world through his church. The greatest word of encouragement is not really a word. It's a picture. It's a person. And it's just Jesus. Amen? Amen? After John saw Jesus, and this is where we get into our text this morning, he received his heavenly commission, and that was to write down the things that he saw, the one that he had seen to describe prophetically. He was empowered to do so, no doubt, to give us a description of the person of Jesus. And we tackled that last week. You can Listen to the message on our website or app or get a CD after the service, but this picture is so powerful. Glance down. Let's go through it quickly in your Bibles with me. Nothing weak, nothing effeminate about this picture of Jesus at all, is there? Robed in righteousness as our great high priest, being eternal in nature, having perfect wisdom, seeing completely, purely, and judging accurately, having been refined wholly by the wrath of God the Father for you and me. Speaking powerfully, John says here, like a thundering waterfall, holding his messengers in his right hand sovereignly, as we'll talk about today, wielding and, and, and speaking with the, the same sword of the Spirit that God has given to you and me graciously, the Word of God, and radiating, lastly, radiating with the brightness of His glory. Amen? Now, verse 17, we continue. John, having described what he saw, he shares with us his response to this vision. And there's so much there. I pray we're considering it devotionally. But it's the vision, the response to the vision that then enabled John to receive his commission. You remember that from last week? So important. He dropped down dead. He saw Jesus. And he fell at his feet as it were dead. Let's read verse 17. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as what? Dead. But he laid his right hand on me, picture this, it's powerful, saying to me, do not be afraid. Why? He just dropped dead. He was terrified. He was afraid. Jesus touched him, comforting him, and then commanded him, do not be afraid. It's me. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, you say, so many amens in Revelation chapter 1. I like it. And I have the keys of Hades and death, or as we say, death and hell. This experience, as we touched on one dimension of it last week, and we'll tackle a new topic in regard to it this morning, this response, this reaction, this experience that John has to the person of Jesus Christ, it's just, it's packed with divine purpose. And another purpose, again, is to clearly communicate a fundamental reality of life. And it's something that God's Word teaches us that one day every person, every soul, whoever lives, will affirm to be true. Paul wrote about it in Philippians 2, verse 9. And it's that Jesus is Lord. 
He says this, therefore God, in light of who he is and what he's done, therefore God has also exalted or highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, and I like this, at the name of Jesus, when I saw him, I fell down dead. So too Paul says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Consider the picture that that John is seeing of Jesus' person here. It's a picture of power. It's a picture of absolute authority, and it is terrifying. Consider that with me for just a minute this morning. How can you say that? How do we know this? Because Jesus clearly tells us this. John fell at his feet, as it were, dead, and Jesus then touches him, maybe resurrects him, I don't know, touches him, comforts him, and says, do not be afraid. What's the point of this picture? What's its purpose? I think as we just read, part of its purpose is to put all things under Jesus' feet. It's to put everything and everyone in their proper place, and that's on their face before the King of kings and Lord of lords, God the Son. I just love this. John fell at his feet as though dead, for that is man's unrestrainable reaction. That's automatic. When? Confronted by the King of kings. You remember when Jesus was praying in the garden with his disciples and the the, uh, the detachment of, of, of troops came in, the Jewish soldiers, to take him. We don't know who it is. So Judas identified him with a kiss. And Jesus then confronted while his disciples fled these soldiers. Who is it you seek, you remember? Jesus of Nazareth. And he simply said in the original language, I am. And what happened? Do you remember? A little Bible trivia. They fell down on their faces, and then it happened a second time. They didn't fall backward, they fell on their faces before him. Who are we dealing with here? Who is this Jesus that at times we, we demean a little bit, maybe not willfully, but in reality? I love this picture of Jesus. I love John's response because it reminds us that Jesus is someone to be feared greatly and reverenced absolutely. Jesus talked about fear. Matthew 10, verse 28, he says this, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Right? So in regard to persecution, suffering, difficulty, even if you lay your life down physically for the Lord, Jesus says, don't be afraid of that. Because I am, right? Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But he says fear. He says be afraid. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Wow. Right? The author of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 31, says something that we should be truly in touch with. He said, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And he's contrasting there between the old covenant and Jesus Christ. He's contrasting between dumb, mute idols and the reality of an almighty God that we're accountable to. I mean, that's a whole different kind of deal, right? having a religion or bowing down to idols, in part they're all the same, as opposed to remembering that I'm accountable to an almighty living God. That's a fearful thing, Hebrews teaches us. Jeremiah 10.10, I love this, says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble. We're going to read about that. Who shall save us from the wrath of the Lamb? We're going to read and observe these things in the Great Tribulation. It's radical. It's real. And there is nowhere to hide, nowhere to run 
from his gaze. So too, Jeremiah says, at his wrath, the earth will tremble. And the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Who are we dealing with here? This Jesus. That sometimes, possibly, we demean a little bit. Because we forget who he is and who he always was and who he always will be. And that is the Almighty. C.S. Lewis, boy, I love those Chronicles of Narnia. And for uh, those of you that are familiar, uh, Aslan is the character that's a type of Jesus Christ. He's got a couple of quotes that are just perfect, man. They're so biblical. There's such theology in these statements. So much we can learn of Jesus through them. So in regard to Aslan, who is a type of Christ, C.S. Lewis wrote, he's wild, you know, not like a tame lion. And then secondly, Mr. Beaver, that's right, Mr. Beaver said this, safe? Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. All of this and so much more, it's beyond our understanding, is true of Jesus Christ, and it's a reality that we should never forget. That is who we are dealing with when it comes to God the Son. And yet, as one Bible student said, read it on the screen with me. All this is true, and yet, when we fall before him, just as we read here, it is not to listen to words of doom, but with all the gentleness that characterizes the bridegroom's action with his bride. Biblical. He lays his hand upon us as upon John and says unto us as unto him, fear not, don't be afraid. And why should we not fear, this Bible student said, the only reason why a believer need not fear is that perfect love casts out fear, as 1 John says. Do you know Jesus Christ this morning? Do you know him as Lord, or is he the Lord of your life, right? Big difference. You should be terrified either way. Amen? But for we believers, we who have placed our faith, our hope, our trust, we who have seen Jesus and fallen at his feet as though dead, we have the privilege in that place of then being touched and comforted, commanded, as we'll see shortly. And it's all about him. One of the reasons I love this picture so much is that it's not about us at all standing in the presence of the Lord, coming boldly. You know, sometimes we just quote those verses just, just a little too flippantly, don't we? Kicking up our feet in God's house or whatever, right? John falls at his feet as though dead, and then right there, Jesus touches him and comforts him and says, hey, buddy, it's me. Come on, I got some things to share with you, to show you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you should be terrified of this Jesus. If you do know Jesus Christ, and he's the Lord and Savior of your life, man, there's still something we have to learn about the fear of the Lord, amen? The difference between the believer and unbeliever is seen in love, isn't it? We who have seen the love of God, we've responded to it. We've said, God, in light of your love, I love you beyond any other love I could ever possibly experience in life, and thus I commit myself to you. What do you want? Take it all. It's yours. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is the ministry that we've obtained through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the touch. It's the voice. Oh, don't be afraid. Get up on your feet. Let's get to work. Let's enter into the Father's business. John here, or this author says, quoting John, lastly, the only reason why a believer need not fear is because perfect love casts out fear. 
And then he says this, let no one complain that they fear because they do not have perfect love, for it is not our imperfect love, but his perfect love that casts out fear. Isn't that great? When I saw him, John says, verse 17, I fell at his feet as what? Dead. There's so much there. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. So he comforts John first with his touch, a compassionate touch. And maybe John recognized that as he was so familiar with Jesus, I don't know. His voice was different. His countenance was changed. But maybe the touch was the same. I don't know. But Jesus touches him compassionately, and then he commands him, don't be afraid. And that's important for us too, isn't it? Don't be afraid as you come into my presence, not because you're worthy to be here, but because I've made a way for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's not just to get to heaven someday. Amen? I've made you able to stand in the presence of an almighty God before whom you should drop dead. Consider Jesus, guys. Amen? Don't be afraid, he says. I've made a way for you. He says, I am the first and the last. And we've talked about this a lot. It's, it's speaking of Jesus' deity, that he's the God of all eternity. He's the God of eternity past, God of eternity present, and God of eternity future. And that's going to play directly into the commission that Jesus is going to give John to write about what he's seen, uh, what's going on presently, and what's to come in the future. It's beautiful. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And you say what? You can write this down. Jesus is giving John his credentials, the credentials of his resurrection, as it were. He lives never to die again. The victory that he's secured for us over sin, death, and hell, it's permanent. It's never going to change. It can't be undone. Peter said this in chapter 3, verse 18 of his epistle. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. I love these little essential truths in the Scripture. He's just, you're not. <laughs> right? The just for the unjust, like me. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by what? Lastly, I love that Jesus says, I've got the keys, man. And these aren't literal keys, you know that, right? It's a picture, but it has a powerful point. I've got the keys. I have control. I have authority over life and death, heaven and hell. I've got the keys of Hades and death, Jesus says here. That's important for me. Jesus just said to John, don't be afraid. Why? Because of all this. And certainly that. I've got the keys of death and hell. I've got all authority. Not anyone or anything else. You know, it's certainly true. Jesus called Satan the, the God of this world, right? He's got some authority. He's got some ability but nothing that God doesn't afford him. Amen? To do what he does until the time is done and then he's done away with forever, right? Satan's not the Lord of hell. Satan's not, you know, uh, uh, like death as it were, the grim reaper just waiting and watching and planning and strategizing and pouncing upon people and all this other nonsense that we hear and read about in, in movies and fictional books and all these kinds of things. It's obvious that Satan, maybe, he, maybe, maybe I found out where he lives. Maybe he lives in Hollywood. Not in hell, like, like people say, well, Satan lives in hell and God lives in heaven. Satan lives in Hollywood. Because all the stuff that comes out of Hollywood like makes him look like you know he's this super powerful, incredible, omnipotent, omniscient being. And nothing could be further from the truth. He's stronger than you, amen, better than me, but he's a created being, a former angel. He is nothing before the king of kings. 
and he has nothing. He can do nothing except what God allows him to do for a very short time. Yeah. Jesus says, I have the keys. I'm not going to lose them, and Satan can't borrow them. I've got the keys, he says. Don't be afraid. And now verse 19 Having seen Jesus, having fallen at his feet as though dead, John receives his commission. And I love that. As we said last Sunday, some of you are still waiting for your commission. God, why am I here? What have you called me to do? Understand, something's got to die in you first. Jesus told us so simply, if we're going to come after him, we have to take up our cross, daily die and, and follow him. And what does that mean? What does it look like? It it is simply summed up in the surrendering of our will, isn't it? God, I want your will more than mine, so I'm going to die to mine. I'm going to put mine aside, my self-centeredness, my, my prideful pursuits in life, and all these kinds of things. God, I just want what you want. I want to place my will underneath yours. Wow. When that death occurs, and it's, uh, uh, it's got to be a repetitious action, doesn't it? When that death occurs, man, our commissions so often come. Jesus commissions John, and here we go. It's the divine outline we've talked so much about. Jesus says, okay, buddy, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things is literally what it says. It's on the screen, great quote. Someone said the key that will unlock many doors in the book of Revelation is this 19th verse of the first chapter. Write, he says, and don't mind the King James, he says, write therefore the things thou sawest, those that are and those that are about to happen after these. From one point of view, he says, this is the most important verse in the book since the failure to realize its announcement of three divisions will bring confusion in the interpretation of many of the visions that follow. Some would say this is a tough book to study, and in part they're right. Down another avenue of thought, they're not. Whether it is or isn't, we recognize this, that God has given directions to the book of Revelation, right? Right? The only book in the Bible that has a promised blessing on it, and the only book in the Bible that has directions inserted right there in the beginning, how to view it, how to look at it, how to read it, so that we can understand it. The divine outline, verse 19, Jesus said, John, write the things which you have seen. This is the structure by which we understand this prophecy, past, present, and future. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are presently, and the things that are going to happen after these things, past, present, and future. Three sections this book is so simply split up into. Now let's tackle that and think it through. Jesus says, write the things which you have seen. Now, this one's not too complicated, right? John just saw something. What did he see? It's not a trick question. He just saw Jesus. Okay, it's a good start. It's a simple beginning. Write the things you have seen. John just saw Jesus, so he writes down what he saw, right? Jesus. He saw the lampstands, which are important. He saw the seven stars, which are essential. Write down what you have seen and so he does that. Chapter 1, the person of Jesus Christ. In the midst of his church, at work through his ministers, in the world, those seven stars. Secondly, the second division, Jesus says, write the things which are presently. And these, as we will go on to see so very simply, are the seven letters, chapters 2 and 3, that John is about to write. Jesus is speaking, John simply recording, I've got something to say to my church, and seven letters are coming out. 
We've talked about the significance of those seven churches. They are seven literal, real churches. John has connection, association with. He pastors these fellowships at that time. And so, send out these letters to those seven churches. Write about the things that are. What's going on right now? And that is my work through my church. I've got some things I need to say. Amen? Thirdly, the third division, it is very vividly apparent that it references the future, dealing with uh, foretelling and that aspect of prophecy, foretelling the future, right about the things which will take place after these things. I'm talking to my church, and now I'm predicting what's going to take place and what's going to come after the work and the ministry of my church. And we'll get into that, chapter 4, verse 1. These are things that we've not seen yet. And there are those that will say, well, the book of Revelation, it's all been fulfilled in the past. And I just think it's silly. I just can't agree. God bless them. Amen? God bless them. Those that we don't really see eye to eye with on certain things in the Scripture, God bless them. But I don't think we've seen happen any time in history what's written in this radical book of prophecy, chapters 4 through the rest of the book, this third section, things that will take place after these things. And some would say, after the church age, the age of grace, when we're with the Lord. It breaks down so perfectly, it's arranged so neatly, this divine outline. Amen? Again, the things you've seen, chapter 1, Jesus Christ. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, Jesus talking to his church. And lastly, chapters 4 through 22, the things which will take place after these things. Verse 20, a mystery is revealed. And I'm so thankful for this before we close. Verse 20. As we said to the first service, you know, we should study to show ourselves approved students of Scripture seeking Bible verses to interpret Bible verses. Amen? So I read something here, and I say, man, I don't understand that. I don't get it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference other verses in the Bible that may speak to the same thing that give me some clarified understanding. Amen? I have found for that most every essential and important biblical doctrine, there's not just one sister verse, but many. So let's study to show ourselves approved, understanding what the Scripture says, referencing, man, back and forth between Old Testament and New. Amen? Jesus gives us the interpretation of these symbols. And that's why I love this so much. No debate, no argument. You can't say they're this when he says they're that, right? The mystery, verse 20, of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Here you go. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Thank you, Jesus. You just cleared it right up. And knowing what these symbols represent, man, we learn a lot about these two things. First of all, the church, and then, as we'll talk about in a minute, the stars in Jesus' right hand, those messengers or angels in those specific seven churches. Firstly, the lampstands. There's more than one. We've talked about that and developed this quite a bit. In addition... I'll just say this, it's on the screen. One Bible student said, every congregation, in light of this vision, must stand by itself independently and be individually responsible to God. Jesus is going to write seven letters to seven different churches. He's got different things to say. In essence, they're all summed up in the meat of Scripture. But some have strengths here and weaknesses there, and so the Lord addresses them independently and individually. Moving on, each lampstand, he says, is on its own base, giving forth its own light distinct from the other congregations. 
Christ in the midst of the lampstand shows us that the individual churches are to be centered in Him, gathered around His Word, because He is the Word. It's just a beautiful picture. I pray we continue to chew on it for so many good reasons. But as we've talked about that already, let's tackle the stars here. Jesus tells us exactly what they are. The seven stars in, in his right hand and my right hand are the angels of the seven churches. In the Greek, it's not really the word angel, but it's the word messengers. Now again, most Bible students will agree on one of two theories. First of all, that these are the pastors or messengers or representatives of God in and to each one of those congregations. And that has the most biblical basis, that thought, that approach. Some will say that these are angels. They're like guardian angels of each and every church. We're not told that. It's probably not that. The word in the Greek is not used predominantly in reference to that. And biblically, it just makes no sense. For this reason, listen to what one Bible student said. Great, great explanation. He said, no angel in heaven could be held responsible for the state of the church on earth. This is clearly a word to human messengers and reveals, listen, that even though there is no difference between the clergy and the laity, the pastor and the people, since God commands all believers to follow his word and to walk worthy of the calling wherewith they have been called, there is nevertheless an increased responsibility upon those who are spiritual leaders because of the increased opportunity for spiritual service. James tells us, and you know this verse, he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Don't do it unless God has told you to do it, called you specifically to that place, because there's a high price of accountability attached to it. Jesus is holding these seven stars in his right hand, and frankly, whether or not they're men, pastors, a lot there to consider, by the way, but we're short on time, or if they are, in fact, you know, angels, guardian angels of these congregations, really doesn't matter. Do you know that? because these letters are not for those messengers, they're for the church. These are Jesus' words being written to the churches. And that's why every single one of these letters ends like this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I could go on and on about that statement, but we're short on time. Maybe I'll just say this. If... I'm a messenger of God, a representative of the Lord in this way. And I amen this, I affirm this personally. It's my greatest privilege. God wants to speak to you. And so he speaks through people like me. Not that we're bigger, badder, better, any more important. In fact, there's a beautiful process in which the Lord reminds me of that reality. Because he pours out such such effective wisdom and power for you. It's not for me. It doesn't come from me. But if I may say, I sit back and watch this sometimes in awe and wonder and see something like this and say, yep, <laughs> the Spirit is speaking to the church. Most often that's not discerned and it's like, hey, nice sermon or whatever. But as one who didn't, you know, think that through or write that down or we get to sit back and just say, wow, the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church and this is extraordinary. Anyway, write the things, we'll wrap it up, which you've seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after this. And with that comes verse 1 of chapter 2. Do you have a few more hours? And we'll just keep going? I'm thinking of the children. God bless you. In reality, you know in the original writing, there's no chapters and no verses. It's one continuous writing. And boy, that verse is the setup for the next section. 
the things which are, what's going on presently. Jesus is concerned with you, your life and your ministry. And so he's going to speak to you. He's going to write to you and think that through. Let it capture your, your heart and mind all week. You get the specific attention of Jesus Christ. I want to hear from the Lord. You're going to hear from the Lord. Trust me. What if Jesus were to write a letter to the church today? I mean like today. What would he say? Get ready for Revelation 2 and 3. And remember who's speaking it. Jesus is wielding the sword of the Spirit. He sees with perfect vision, perfect, pure vision, accurately into your heart, into your mind, into your life. And he's going to speak. He affirms, he encourages, and oh, (laughs) he tears us apart in Revelation 2 and 3, doesn't he? Wielding that sword of the Spirit, performing that divine surgery so we can be healed and we can be whole and we can be used for his glory. It's exciting. Lord, turn our hearts this morning as we close to you. Would every other lesser love, any idolatrous image in our life, anything that exists at all, would it be torn down, ripped apart, laid at your feet, This morning as we turn to see you, would something in us die? And you know what that is. You know what it needs to be. So we're just here as a well-loved and yet dysfunctional family. God, we're just saying, Jesus, work in me. Perform that surgery on me. Prepare me, Lord, by speaking specifically to me, addressing me, where I live. Help us to be those who hear the voice of your Spirit that's speaking right now, Father. And those who just recognize that we are privileged to obey. Who are we that you would give us your attention? Individual affection. God, it's radical. Anything that's good for us, Whatever's beneficial, Lord, you're going to address it. You're going to speak to it. You want to perfect us, Lord, to impart joy and happiness like we've never known before. And so we just yield our lives to that end. We trust you who still bear the scars of those nail marks, your pierced side, the thorns on your brow, your back, You still bear those scars, the evidence of your love. Help us to trust you and surrender our lives to you. And maybe we've never done that for the first time. Let it be today. God, I surrender my life to you. You're the Lord and I'm not. Cleanse me, wash me, forgive me of all my sin. Empower me with your spirit to love you and live for you. Save from the uttermost today, Lord, we pray. And raise us up as your people, God, proud of you, bold for you, Lord, hungry and thirsty for you, longing to meet you, Lord, face to face, as we will so soon. How thankful we are for you, Jesus. Continue to work with us in our community, in our city, in your world, Lord. We are privileged to partner with you. Send us out now in Jesus' name, we say. Be seated for just a moment, if you would.